A strange heat-resistant material created by a British hairdresser could survive blasts that would melt steel, but its formula vanished when he died. Ancient swords that could slice through metal like it was paper were made with a secret steel recipe lost to time and still impossible to perfectly copy. And a type of concrete built 2,000 years ago can actually repair its own cracks. These are lost inventions scientists today can't recreate. Starlight was this weird, almost unbelievable material created by a British hairdresser named Maurice Ward during the uh, 70s and 80s. Somehow he'd come up with a substance that could supposedly handle insane amounts of heat. Heat that would melt metal, vaporize plastic, and kill you instantly. But this starlight material would hold up against it. This clip here is from BBC's Tomorrow's World, which aired in 1990. Here they blowtorch an egg coated in the material, and when they crack it open, the egg inside is still raw. This segment introduced a lot of people to this new form of plastic, which could supposedly withstand nuclear level heat and space re-entry temperatures. Obviously, NASA and Boeing were interested, even weapons labs wanted it. But Ward was paranoid about getting ripped off, so he never let anyone keep a sample. He let them test it, sure, but he kept the formula a secret. Supposedly, only a couple people in his family ever knew it. We still don't really know what it was made of. Oddly, one of his daughters claimed, though, that it was safe enough to eat and that they'd fed it to dogs and horses. I wonder how they found that out. Anyway, unfortunately, Maurice Ward died in 2011, so we may never know how this stuff was made. There was once a sword so sharp and strong it became legendary across the ancient world. They were called Damascus Blades. These blades were incredible. They could slice through metal, and not only that, they were also gorgeous, with these swirling, water-like patterns in them. But by the 18th century, production just stopped. We have examples of these swords, but no one today can completely recreate the process. Blacksmiths and scientists have tried, and yeah, you can get close, but something's just missing. The steel actually came from India and Sri Lanka where blacksmiths made something called Wutz steel. They melted iron in small sealed containers with special plant materials and let it cool super slowly. That slow cooling created tiny particles of carbon inside the metal. Some scientists think those particles formed little tube-like structures, basically carbon that organized itself in a way that made the steel way stronger than normal. The knowledge just kind of disappeared. Maybe the specific ore they used ran out, maybe the trade routes that delivered the right ingredients got cut off, but whatever happened, by the 1700s, it was gone. You can technically buy Damascus blades today, but they're not genuine Damascus steel. They just look really nice. And they probably cut pretty well. We all know the Pantheon and ancient Roman bridges have stood for over 2,000 years. Most modern concrete can fall apart in about 50 to 100 years, especially in harsher conditions, but clearly not ancient Roman concrete. Well, there's a trick. Romans mixed volcanic ash called pozzolana with quicklime and heated it before adding water. This creates bits of lime clasts, which are hard lumps that aren't normally in modern concrete. When cracks formed and water seeped in, those lime clasts dissolved a bit and sealed the crack by growing calcite crystals back in place. So basically, it almost glues itself back together. Scientists from MIT tested this. They made the Roman mix, broke it, soaked it in water, and the cracks healed up in weeks. Modern concrete just crumbles apart. If you ever found yourself on fire back in ancient Greece, you always knew there was plenty of water to hop into. But there's one instance where not even water would save you. Greek fire. This was the Byzantine Empire's secret weapon. It was terrifying because it could burn on water. Perfect for naval battles, which there were a lot of. There's also evidence they had pressurized devices on ships that acted like early flamethrowers. The fire would shoot out in a stream. Not only would it continue to burn on water, but it also stuck to stuff. We still don't know exactly what it was made of. 
The exact formula seemed to be a secret, probably only a handful of people knew it, and it was never written down in full. If it was, we have no record of it anyway. Historians think there was some kind of mix involving crude oil plus additives like sulfur, pitch, or quicklime. A few modern attempts have come close, but none can fully match what Greek fire supposedly did. In 132 CE, a Chinese inventor named Zhang Heng built something that could detect earthquakes long before anyone could feel them. It was called a seismoscope, and it worked so well that when one of its indicators went off, people thought it had malfunctioned until a messenger showed up days later confirming a quake had hit far away. This was basically a big bronze vessel surrounded by eight dragon heads, each holding a metal ball. Below each one was a toad with its mouth open. When a distant earthquake hit, one of the balls would drop pointing to the direction the quake came from. Nobody really knows how it worked. Some scientists think there was a pendulum inside that shook when the ground moved and somehow set off the ball drop, but nobody really knows for sure. The original device is long gone, and there's no blueprint or clear instructions on how it was built. People have tried to rebuild it using different mechanisms. Some get the ball drop system to work, but none of them function quite like the records say the original did. What makes this so amazing is that it was reportedly able to detect quakes hundreds of miles away without modern sensors. For something built nearly 2,000 years ago, that's insane. The Lycurgus cup is this glass goblet from the 4th century that looks green when you shine light in front of it, but stick a light behind it and it turns deep red. Why? Because it's loaded with tiny gold and silver particles, so tiny they're measured in nanometers, roughly a thousand times smaller than a grain of salt. The gold makes it glow red when the light passes through, and the silver reflects green when light bounces off it. That's how the colors flip depending on where the light's coming from. Scientists finally figured this out about 60 years ago. They used electron microscopes to spot the microscopic metal blobs in the glass. People have tried to recreate this. There's some experimental 3D printed stuff going on, but we still don't know exactly how the Romans nailed it so perfectly all those years ago. Somehow ancient glassmakers made this thing, maybe without knowing any of the science behind it. There's a theory that they accidentally created this thing, which would be pretty interesting. Everyone knows a Stradivarius violin sounds amazing, but even today no one can fully explain why. Antonio Stradivari built these legendary instruments in Italy during the late 1600s and early 1700s. About 650 are still around, each are worth millions. Scientists have studied the wood, the varnish, and the structure using everything from CT scans to chemical tests. Some think the secret is the density of the wood itself. It grew during a mini ice age. Trees grow slower when it's cold, and that makes the wood rings tighter and more uniform. That kind of wood vibrates differently, it carries sound better and more evenly across the body of the instrument, which of course helps produce that clean, warm tone these violins are known for. The varnish is another mystery. Stradivari used some kind of mix involving tree resin, oil, maybe even borax to stop bugs. Whatever it was though, it soaked into the wood just the right amount without killing the sound. People have tried to recreate it, but no one can get it exactly right. Even tiny differences in how thick the varnish was or how long it cured could change the way the violin sounds. So yeah, modern makers can get close, but something in Stradivari's process, maybe the wood, maybe the varnish, maybe both, is still a mystery. King Tutankhamun's dagger is literally alien. The dagger is made from nickel-rich meteorite iron that was smithed into a razor-sharp blade around 1330 BCE. Scientists confirmed this by analyzing the metal. They found about 11% nickel, way above what's normal. Uh, for Earth rock, that is. Now, Egypt was still in the Bronze Age. Iron smelting wasn't a thing yet, so they likely hammered a chunk of meteorite into shape. It's possible they heated it a bit to soften it, but definitely nothing like modern forging. Today, we can analyze it, scan it, and tell you where the meteor came from, but we still don't know exactly how they worked with it, how they shaped it so precisely, and how it came out looking as good as it does. Now for one of the weirdest ones on the list, flexible glass or vitrum flexile. So a story from the reign of Emperor Tiberius in the first century says that an inventor brought Tiberius a bowl made of glass. 
it wouldn't shatter when it dropped, it just dented. And the guy could also hammer it back into shape. Tiberius asked if anyone else knew how to make it. The inventor said no, it was his secret. So Tiberius had him killed. Why? Well, supposedly the emperor didn't want the secret getting out because it might devalue gold and silver. No one's ever found an actual piece, so there's a good chance this is just a myth, but some researchers think it might have been real. Still, we've never found archeological proof of this. The only evidence is in stories. But if it was real, it would mean that Roman glassmakers invented shockproof glass centuries before it was a thing. And we may never know exactly how. All right, this one's wild. Tesla basically wanted to invent a peace weapon that would end all wars. Around 1934, he started talking publicly about something he called the Teleforce device, later nicknamed the Death Ray. The idea was pump super high energy through a beam of particles so powerful it could bring down armies or planes from hundreds of miles away. He claimed he could stop an entire fleet of enemy aircraft at 250 miles and that countries with it would be virtually untouchable. He tried to get funding from the US, Britain, even offered it to the League of Nations. The Soviets apparently kicked in $25,000 but nobody ever saw a functioning model. After Tesla died, a bunch of his papers went missing, so there's a chance there was blueprints of this that have just been lost forever or hidden away somewhere. With all that said though, I've been your host James and I'll catch you, yes you specifically, in the next video. Mm -hmm.